So this is my mum and dad, and I'm Claire, and I'm in the middle, and I'm aged eight. And um, we always used to go hiking in North Wales every week. As a matter of fact, it uh, is, or it has been all of my life, a really important ritual, a family thing that we do walking in the mountains. Um, about this time in my life, um, though, I was having really profound dreams. I was dreaming sort of quite vividly. And um, there's one dream I remember. I was sat having breakfast with my mum at the breakfast table and there was a knock on the door. Um, so I went to get it and I opened the door and there was a giant gorilla standing there. And the gorilla picked me up and took me away. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. Years later, I'm lecturing at the University of Hull and in the morning, I'm lecturing on uh, postmodernism and performance, and I'm looking at the overly pastiched figure of King Kong. <laughs> and in the afternoon, I was teaching theatre practice, um, where um, I was directing a production of King Lear. I was directing the students in their final production of King Lear. That evening, um, I went for dinner with my friend Tony, and he said to me, what have you been teaching today, Claire? And I said, uh, Kong Lear. <laughs> and we both cracked up like that. It was an immediate laugh. And we sort of laughed at this idea that it was a Freudian slip. And every now and again, he teased me about it. Years later, I was making a new show with the wonderful Alexander Kelly, who's here from Third Angel tonight, over there. Uh, um, and we were making a show called Ghost Track, and it was about father figures. It was about King Lear and that awful moment when he divides his kingdom up. Um, but it was a one-woman show. And during that time as well, I invited another artist called Gary Winters to collaborate. And um, I told Gary Winters that um, Tony and I had found this Freudian slip years ago, and it was just an anecdote. However, Gary sort of looked at me and imagined a figure of Kong Lear on the walls in York. And I sort of did as well. And we both started imagining a life for Kong Lear. And this is Kong Lear. <laughs> <laughs> she is a hybrid of King Kong and King Lear, but as a woman. And she comes with her own story. She sort of also comes with the story that I've had of watching Catherine Hunter every night when I worked at Front of House and as a student at the Haymarket Leicester in Theatre. And Catherine Hunter took on the most remarkable King Lear I've ever seen. And she was the first woman to play King Lear in mainstream theatre. So Kong Lear was a complex figure. We made a Super 8mm film with her. We did a walking tour in York. And then she subsequently developed into lots of performances in shows that we toured on stages like this uh, internationally. And we got an invite from the Freud Museum. The Freud Museum invited us to, to share Kong Lear with them. We weren't sure how it was going to go down. And, um, of course, I arrive on the day of the performance, but I arrive as Kong Lear. And I get uh, to the Freud Museum, and I walk into Freud's study, and um, he's there. Sigmund Freud is sat there. And he says, so, Kong Lear, how have you been feeling? <laughs> Uh, I was all right. He said, why don't you take a seat on my couch? And I said, I couldn't possibly. I'm far too big for your couch. Look at it, I'm Kong Lear. And he says, ah, is that a reference to your childhood, do you think? I was like, no, 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 no. Just, I'm, you see, I'm Kong Lear, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a King Kong and I'm a, and a King Lear as, as a woman. And he says, ah. So what you're trying to say really is that this has got something to do with your childhood. <laughs> Freud, please just listen to me. Look, your couch is tiny. It's peewee. It's minikin. There's no way I'm going to fit on it. And he said, ah, so what you're saying by sublimation is this has got something to do with your childhood and perhaps your mother was enraged. I picked up the couch. I snapped it in two. I started looking for a phallic object. I found loads. I was like, oh. There's one. I picked one up and I threw it out of the window and the window smashed. And I just grabbed hold of Freud, put him under my arm. And I ran out into the garden. 
and I gently put him down because I wasn't an aggressive figure and I started tickling him <laughs> under his chin and under his armpit and he couldn't get enough of it so I kept tickling and tickling and then I just ended up chewing on his leg into the world of a practice-led researcher. Methodologies. Dream Yards is an ambulatory performance taking an audience through the city as if in a collective dream experience, collective lucid dream, to encourage further dreaming for every audience member involved. It toured internationally, starting as a weekly performance in the city of York, the personas, Kong Lea and her fool, weave dream stories donated by the public into a fictional story relating Kong Lee and her fool to retell the dreams of the audience which informed the performance's narrative in situ with sight. We set up a dream collection point, several dream collection points, to meet people who would be our future audiences and dreamers. We asked them to write or draw on, on a beer mat and within restrictive space, thus inviting them to be descriptive but editing their dream for detail. This was a lovely way to meet folk and converse. We were looking as scriptwriters and performers into the cyclical stages of the dream journey as dramaturgy. The research examined the relationship between the dreaming brain and performance making, and play-based strategies were used to engage city residents in the subject of dreaming, including their own dreams, to contribute content. The structure of the script was composed around scientific understandings of dream patterns throughout sleep, which include repeated cycles of awake, sleep stage one, sleep stage two, sleep stage three, sleep stage two, REM, sleep stage two, sleep stage three, two, REM, two, REM, two, REM, two, REM late morning. Writing created material using this cycle in relation to each physiological sleep state formed a non-linear structure, which meant the cycle set the conditions of the performance, composing material to correspond with each sleep stage as an experience with sight to map the route of the performance, a journey through the cyclical ways of York as if passageways in the brain. On tour, we looked for equivalent spaces in Norwich, Plymouth and in New York City. Using this cycle caused a playful, disorientated effect for the audience as if in a dream. And the audience's dream accounts complemented the physical embodiment of the sleep cycle as evidence in claims that the perceptions were altered. We discovered that dreaming takes place throughout all the stages of sleep, and not just in REM sleep. To be more accurate, there are three periods of sleep where you tend to dream more. The main one is REM sleep. The second one, and most common, is sleep stage one. <laughs> you know, that moment where you get that to jump. That's sleep stage one. It's called sleep onset. And the third one is when you're heading towards awakening, which is called the late morning effect. This meant that we could write up specific narratives to coincide with the full sleep cycle. Ideas that narrative threads could appear and disappear and then reappear uh, in different contexts to suit the dream states. For example, the late morning effect was developed in line with the fool's disappearance and at the end of the dream yard's walking tour, where Kong Lear has a realisation that her fool is not returning. It has to be noted that we are not, at any stage of the project, interpreting dreams. Excuse me, trying to work out meaning and sharing our personal thoughts on someone's dreams is not um, the project. Rather, we acknowledge that we are sentient beings and we do feel dreams. Walking through the stages of sleep together was a way to experience lucidity collectively and connect dreaming to the health benefits of sleep. Perceptions of the city were altered in this lucid experience too especially of walking. I turn a corner and it feels like late spring or summer. Warm enough to be without a coat, cool enough to feel an admonishing breeze. We are at a crossroads, a wide exposed pavement, where two figures with giant heads look into the bronze scale model of the city. Is this something I should note? Is this part of their performance? 
is this another world? We continue across the street corner as the road narrows and we are entering Old York. We fall in step to the music, a loop of city and dreams. I look to other people passing and people look at us. Some don't even see us. We turn down Stonegate and pass the ghost tour folk, but it's us that feels like the ghosts of this city. We gather after walking through a narrow snickleway that opens into a yard. I'm handed a dream yard sign to hold. I feel a little cosy as if I'm sleeping. He shakes an egg and feigns a throw. We all duck to avoid getting an egg in our face. We realise he still has the egg in his hand. I can't stop laughing, but we brush our hand on an alley wall to check if this is all real. In 2021, Laurie Anderson asked, what are nights for? What are nights for? To fall through time into another world. Dear Gary and Claire, I don't remember my dreams ever, but since your dream yard's walking performance, I'm dreaming most nights that I'm buttering toast. It's a start. <laughs> Do you know what? I had the most amazing teachers at university. I have to sort of give them credit. Um, a teacher called Claire MacDonald, or a lecturer called Claire MacDonald, who's also an artist, um, was teaching writing for performance at the time, and she told me to write for uh, nurture neglected spaces. She said, look for neglected spaces and write out of them. And then she brought in um, Tim Etchells, and Tim Etchells taught us performance writing, um, and Tim Etchells is the, co uh, is the artistic director of Forced Entertainment. So I was very lucky to have these really incredible artists to work with at university. But Tim said to me, and the rest of the group, as a task, as a research task, write for an impossible space. So I was thinking, what is an impossible space? So my first thoughts of an impossible space was where I sort of grew up in my childhood, the sort of weekly visits to Coo Midwill in North Wales. And this is a split in the rock, in the mountain. Uh, it's known as Devil's Kitchen, or Tul Di in Welsh, which means black hole. And in my head, that's where I immediately went. You know, when you get a broad task like that, I went immediately to this, what I perceived as an impossible space. Little did I realise that years later, I would be on the advisory board of the International Performing Mountain Symposium at the University of Leeds. And these stories are really important to me because a professor of mine at the time, Professor Noel Witts, said to me, Claire, I've just graduated, he said, Claire, you've got to go to Romania and see this amazing festival, the Sibiu International Theatre Festival. So I went, and um, I remember looking for neglected space and impossible spaces. It just became this language that I sort of tapped into, and I think it was really useful to think of these as sort of metaphorical, conceptual, but also literal as well. And I noticed at the festival there wasn't a lot of provision for... Um, the local people. They were invited to shows, but there wasn't a presence of the local people in the performances or presenting work. So I immediately set up a project at a local orphanage and worked with children who had, um, were hearing impaired. And I performed um, a short performance for the children and unpacked that through nonverbal communication, improvisation, and um, it worked to a certain degree. But I came back to the UK and I said to my students, we've got to do something about this. We've got to develop a model that works across languages that we can actually um, go back and return and work with the children uh, to develop a show for them in the, in, the, in the festival. And we did that. And the students were amazing. They, they wrote some fantastic rules for us to play to, work out of. And this project was going for about 12 years. It was a sort of a long project that we went yearly, sometimes twice yearly, and ROM TV made a television programme about the work that we were doing with the children. And it was just a magical moment. And every year after the 10 day stint, you know, at the festival, working every single day to make this happen, this was a performance. At the end of the performance, we made Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, sorry, forgive me, we didn't. It was The Tempest, get it right. <laughs> it was the Tempest. And we made a visual performance, and Simon, Simon's in the audience, and um, Simon was here helping um, put this together. Uh, a few of the people who are here in the audience have been to Romania with me, and I'm hoping that you remember those times with fondness. Um, but at the end of the 10-day 
project, we would always go to Poltanish. And Poltanish was a beautiful mountain in the Sindral range, which is part of the Carpathian Mountains. And the Carpathian Mountains surround this beautiful um, city called Sibiu. And every time we went, at the end of the week, I would always take my students uh, to watch the sunrise. Magical moments. Talking of magical moments. <gasps> Fortunate enough to have a, a relationship with the Norwegian Theatre Academy and for eight years I've been working with them, sort of supporting them developing their programs and also a research project that developed between, the, between partners, York St. John University, Norwegian Theatre Academy and MIT in the States. And together we developed a project that related to the archive and performance. Um, but that's another story for another time. Um, we're talking magical moments. So um, one year, I mean, the Frederikstad, the place that the Norwegian Theatre Academy is, is south um, of Norway. But one year, only two and a half years ago, um, I was invited by two artists to collaborate with them on a project and invited to go to the far north of Norway in a little island called Ondanes. And it's north of the Arctic Circle. And when you get an invite to somewhere like that, you start to think of all of the magic possibilities of, of a place like this. You know, it just sounds like it's full of magic. You just have all of these ideas in your head of what this place is going to be like and what you're going to see. Of course, when I arrived, we went f straight into a run of making this show for the festival. So it was full on, and the most I saw was the theatre space. But on the last day, Nicoline and Victoria took me out for a drive around the island. It was in the evening, it was very dark. And the first thing they took me to was gong yoga. And gong yoga, you have this massive gong, and they, they hit the gong and the vibrations come. I'm sure they have it in York. However, gong yoga in the north of Norway on an island Further north in the Arctic Circle seems pretty special and felt pretty special. There's a sort of vibrations going through you. We came out of gong yoga and we were so relaxed, there was a really beautiful, comfortable silence in the car as we drove through the, by the coast. Suddenly, out of the sky comes a meteor, no word of a lie, and it had a green and gold tail attached to it. This beautiful meteor just went flying past and landed in the snow. And my friend Nicoline, who was driving, said, I've lived here all my life, that's never happened. So I was like, wow, gong yoga, meteor. <laughs> then uh, we drove through the mountains, pitch black, and Nicoline says, oh, we have to get out of the car. So we got out of the car. Above our heads was the northern lights. It was spectacular, but all of this was happening in the space of 25 minutes. So it's like <laughs> gong yoga, sort of meteor, sort of northern lights. And then the next thing, Victoria came running out of the woods, screaming, because she'd gone to have a wee. And she came. <laughs> And she ran out because she was being chased by a moose. So they're like, gong yoga, so then a meteor, yeah, northern lights, and a moose. And honestly, it all happened at once. And I love coincidences. I always tell my students to write out, when you write and create a material, write out of those coincidences, because they're magical. And it really did happen, honestly, in the space of half an hour. One, one year, I was teaching uh, a course called Writing After Beckett. And Beckett is, if you, if you teach Beckett, it's sort of renowned, really, that Beckett is always present with you in the room when you teach. Now, when I tell my students that, I say, look, I don't mean it literally, okay? You always bring a writer into the space with you, a writer that you're sort of inspired by. It's always good to have that presence with you when you're making your own work. So you don't sort of work isolated. But also because most of Beckett's plays have this sort of omnipresent figure, a voice of some sort that is sort of looming, it's there, but you don't quite know, it's not fully explained. And we were writing, we were working on an exercise where you write out of the light and you write out of the dark, and you write out of the concepts of off and on. They're pretty simple concepts, but you get some really exciting material uh, when you write in this way. But I was telling them a story about the light and the dark and the off and the on, and as soon as I started talking about that, the light above our head in the studio started to flicker off and on. And one student said, oh my God, Beckett is here. <laughs> it's not, really, it's a coincidence, right out of these spaces. So, um, 
Not so long ago, I, uh, with Gary Winters, we were working in the North York Moors. Um, um, we were working on a neon light project. These phrases came from residents of Gillygate. We worked on the street for two years, working and supporting independent traders and uh, on a place making sort of project. And some of that project drifted into our other practices. Some of the phrases that they had, hopes for their businesses surviving, ended up being written into our neon lights. And we toured these neon lights to the North York Moors in rural locations. But I was having dinner one night, I just keep having these dinners, don't I, with my friend Gary, and I told him the story about the Beckett uh, uh, lights flicking on and off. And as soon as I told him this, in the cafe, called The Fisherman's Wife, it's like a, di it's like a diner, it's like a David Lynch diner. And um, I was telling him the story, and as soon as I said, the light started flickering off and on. The light in The Fisherman's Cafe started flickering off and on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off and on no other light in the cafe was doing that Too, playfully and canny. I'm a practice-led researcher. My theatre is intermedial. The performance can be live, made for film, or visual art exhibition. I write for charged spaces, imagined territories that establish some of the world that coexists in our real world, where the everyday meets an experience of the uncanny. Brown and Vaughan state that play is a purposeless activity that it provides enjoyment and a suspension of self-consciousness and a sense of time. Yet this suggests that play is simply for fun. But from experience, I assert that play is productive. It permits us to use our imagination. It allows us to understand our complex selves so that we may transform identities, change perceptions, and offer alternative ways to think about the world or, engage, or indeed engage with the world. Through play, we may shift attitudes away from stereotype, challenge patriarchy. Through play, we might encourage a better night's sleep. To be playful is to test the limits of something. Playing directly relates to repetition. We play to repeat, to sustain an experience. To be playful, for me, sometimes encourages a humorous sentiment. I often find myself working from a kittenish or mischievous approach. Yet, I have always taken play seriously. No gimmicks. Despite the gorilla, no gimmicks. <laughs> if you play seriously as a thing, or with a thing, as an experience, the content is not ironic, but sincere. Kong Lear is also melancholic. She has a subtext. There are things in the films and the performances that hold many secrets, sometimes troubled. She attaches herself to nature. Non-human has desires. Roger Kawa, his idea of the sentiment as if, performs the same function as rules, meaning rules themselves create fiction. <coughs> Brown and Vaughan claim that play is not an activity, but a state of mind. But I argue that play is an activity. It's a state of mind, it's also an attitude toward the making and doing, towards the playing activity itself. Playing in performance uncovers complex systems, slippery territories. So I developed a term in my research that I named the multiple as if where the sentiment of as if develops into a multiple layer of experiences and attitudes, where we are playing, at playing, at playing, at playing. If you place a play frame over a learning and teaching experience within a game's conditions and restrictions, then a learner can apply both a distance to their experience because they have a frame to work to and paradoxically get drawn in, absorbed in an experience's conditions. The rules operate as tasks that we repeat and in turn create fictions that seduce us into a deeper level of engagement and we are in play's magic thrall. The advice I give to many of my students and artists who are developing a new concept for writing performance is to imagine the longevity of an idea. Catch its drift. Get caught up 
in a circular experience. And we elaborate on this in the book that was written by Gary Winters and myself called Embodying the Dead. Imagine a vista, unobstructed space, a horizon, <coughs> a zone of energy is forming, heat rises, there is a sense of something bubbling up, starting to churn around. It starts to take on a defined form as a mesocyclone. It is an idea drawing in images, text, material, until it defines its signature shape of a funnel. Once it's established, it's complete, nothing else goes into it. The matter is circling around and around. You are now looking at a very strong, defined tornado, and you should imagine the rotation as a circling movement of a death drift. This death drift will not leave an idea alone, and it's playfully wreaking havoc through the constant circling activity, surfing its contents. Now close your eyes and then open them again, and you will see an uncanny likeness to the first tornado, this one a little finer, with delicate qualities. Close and reopen your eyes, and there is a spindly one, with scraggy qualities. Repeat. All these twisters are doppelganger versions of the original, and this spectacle offers multiple versions of the first, and they all contain their own little worlds, all slightly changed, and they contain their own rules and conditions, like a variety of stormy cocktails. <laughs> Metaphors, we always use them, don't we, artists? <laughs> Someone once told me that anyone can have an idea, well, anyone can have an idea, but sometimes ideas are thrown away, or blocked, or taken. Yet, back in the day when women struggled to get their ideas heard, you know, when women really fought to get their ideas taken seriously, do you remember that back in the day? <laughs> a friend of mine gave me a card, and the illustration on the front of the card was of a board meeting, a packed board meeting, and the caption read, that's a great idea, Miss Strix. Perhaps one of the men here would like to suggest it. <laughs> Sorry, I crossed the line. No, I mean a conceptual line. Because this is the station where I give informed uh, material. This is the lecture moment, my micro-lecture moment. Uh, this is the serious uh, sort of state. Over there in the middle is the anecdotal, where I tell stories and maybe occasionally we'll go into a joke. And over there on the tread, steps are on the boots, that's where the magic happens. <laughs> but I crossed a line here because I started to see what I did, I blended that with this. I just crossed a line. But let's get back to the missus, shall we? Shall we talk about this as a serious issue, the missus? Yeah? Should we go there? Because a long time ago I took a toaster back to Dixon's. was faulty and I needed a refund and um, they said oh yes um, is it miss mrs or Ms? Um, and at that point I thought I've got to get a PhD <laughs> so I did I went I worked really hard for five years with the amazing Professor Mick Wallace, who's here in the audience tonight. I worked really hard, blood, sweat and tears, was unpacking the complexities of play, looking at the relationship between dark and deep play, and I got it. I got uh, a PhD. So the first thing I did was I went to Dixon's to buy the toaster. <laughs> but, but it wasn't there anymore. It closed down. There's no more Dixon's. But anyway, so I got this title, Doctor. I was absolutely delighted with this title. And all of a sudden, I knew everything. I knew absolutely everything. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm a doctor now. But the problem with that was I was, no, I was knowing the wrong things. Because you know I'm psychic, right? I mean, those of you that know me know that because sometimes people call me Claire Voyant. <laughs> uh, or sometimes they call me Claire Sentient. Uh, or sometimes, you know, well, actually, once I became a doctor, I realised I was claircognizant. I was all-knowing. I knew everything, especially medical ailments. So <laughs> a friend came to the house and she was complaining of a really sore foot. And I said, oh, my God, let's have a look. Yes, it's gout. <laughs> so, and I was right. I was right. Result. She went to the GP and she got some medication. And then another friend of mine... Um, had a lethargy, she was really suffering from tiredness, and I said, have you checked your thyroid levels? She went and she got her thyroid levels checked and she was underactive. 
uh, and I just had this sort of power to sort of read people's ailments. But everything I knew about theatre had just gone. I didn't know anything about theatre anymore. Nothing. And you know what it's like, academics in the audience. The more you teach, the more you read, the more you practice, the less you feel like you know. You've got that voice going, mm, do you really know this? Sorry, students, we do know what we're talking about. We do. We do. But it's that sort of feeling, it's that sort of strange feeling, isn't it? Do I really know this? But yes, of course, when I, when I became a doctor, I was delighted. And I've had that title for years, sits comfortably with me. In fact, bless my gorgeous students, last year I was teaching them and at the end of the session, they said, Claire, we've decided if there was ever a chance to vote for you, we would. We would want to be, we would want you to be the next Doctor Who and we would vote for you to be the next Doctor Who. <laughs> I was like, brilliant, I'll take that. I'll be the next Doctor Who. But recently I went back to an electrical store, very recently, um, with my daughter and um, I bought a telly. And these days you don't even have to, have to ask for a refund to be asked about your marital status. So I bought a telly and they said, is it Miss, Mrs or Ms? And I said, huh, it's doctor, actually. And my daughter elbowed me. And she said, but you're a professor. Like, oh, my God, I'm a professor, of course. And I started to realize I've not taken it on yet. Not really, truly taken that title on yet. I think it's because I've been in this liminal space, this space where I have to have an inaugural in order to make it matter, to have this sort of ceremony. It's the music. I'm in one and Gary's in the other. Um, they either exist on their own as roving performances of non-geometrical shapes um, or they exist as part of a live studio show where at the very end of the show Gary and I in front of the audience get changed into them and glide out of the auditorium with the audience in tow. Once at a festival in Norwich we performed the live show got changed into the heaps, drifted out, but the audience wouldn't stop following us. They loved us so much, and we just kept going and going, to the point at which we ended up on the ring road uh, at, at Toys R Us. And that is, honestly, that's the truth. And at one point, I remember thinking, that this has got to stop. Um, fortunate enough to take this work to Chicago, we were, we were performing at the Defibrillator Gallery in Chicago, and at the end of the show, we, we again, we left uh, the premises. It's a gallery space this time, not a theatre. And immediately outside the gallery, there's a pedestrian crossing. Um, Gary and I can't really see very well in these. So the risk assessment is a bit, you know, really takes some hard, uh, you know, it's, you need to do a risk assessment. Um, <laughs> but we glided out and we went um, through the neighbourhoods in Chicago and ended up out in Wicker Park with two really sincere audiences members going, please tell me who you are. <laughs> and uh, we were in Gillygate, Pontefract, 
And because uh, we do these twinning projects with the streets, Jilly Gate in Pontefract, Jilly Gate York, Giles Gate in Norwich. And um, we were there on the street. We had uh, permission from the council to be there. We had an agreement for everybody that, that runs their independent shops on the street to do this. And Arts Council funding. So we thought, brilliant. Everybody that needs to know we're here. Uh, everybody that needs to know that we're here knows. So it's fine. Um, but I can't see very well through, through it. There's a tiny little gap where the light comes in. And because it's that furry material, it gives a fuzzy lens. You can't really see. But Gary and I communicate with feedback from megaphones. And it sounds something like, ooh, wow, wee, to, to each other. So we sound a bit like whales talking to one another. And it sort of keeps us in check. Um, but um, I, I was looking out and I thought, what's that? And it's a pedestrian area in um, Gilligate Pontefract. And a police car came. And I remember thinking, OK, I've got to get out of this heap um, because I need to let the police someone know it's absolutely fine. Um, but I can't get out of it because the way it's built, it's, a, it's, a, it's just so DIY. It's a backpack with um, sort of um, gazebo poles and the material just thrown over the top of us. But I'm too small to reach to get it off. Gary has to come over at the end of the performance and, and take it off me physically. So I could see the policewoman coming, and I was trying to reach, and I can't, I just can't do it. So all of a sudden, the policewoman shouts, What are you? <laughs> what are you doing? What's it for? So I'm trying my hardest to reach, and I can't get out of this thing, and this is, I'm not, it's not even exaggerated for the sake of comedy, really. This is exactly what happened. Who are you? What's it for? And then she said, I'm coming in. So I put my out. And I, I had a balaclava on. And I didn't want to be nutty. You didn't want anyone to think that there was a human in there. So as soon as she said, I'm coming in, I sort of quickly sort of tried to get the, the balaclava up above my head. And she got in at the right time, so it's fine. The, the thing closed behind her. And we were both there, face to face. She said, what is it? What are you doing? And I had this sound effect going, gilly gut, gilly gut, gilly gut, <laughs> kicking off. And because we've worked with the local residents making recordings of their voices because we wanted them to be part of this work. And Ashley from the jewellery store doesn't say gilly gut, he says gilly gut. And he loves saying gilly gut. And he'd recorded it and it was saying gilly gut, gilly gut. And she said, what is this? And I just, like that, and she said, are you drama? <laughs> And I said, uh, yes, we are drama. And she said, brilliant, fantastic, great, off you go, on your way. And she got out of the heap and Gary and I glided down Jilly Gate, Pontefract, like wayfarers on a, on a mysterious voyage. Micro Lecture 3, Walking Arts. What is the relationship between walking and writing? How might writing be scored? Or sorry, how might walking be scored? A collaboration spanning eight years with Claire Coleman, who is at the University of East London, and she runs the Walking Artists Network. Whilst part of the research group exploring the social and cultural functions of walking, Claire and I noted there was not enough published material out there by way of creative, invitation, no guides or instructions in relation to walking practice and led by women. So I took this photograph in the summer of 2015. A group of us from the research group were walking on a beach at Leylant uh, in Cornwall, thick, dense fog. Now the, the cover of our book, Ways to Wonder. So Claire and I de devised the concept of the wonder school. Our call asks for artists to to create a walking task that they would like to, to, to write up and share with others. So we created rules for its design, very simple rules. Restricted space to edit and refine their idea. Minimum 300 words, 350 words, uh, uh, sorry, maximum 350 words to suit a small page. And the wonder scores made by artists are for anyone to experience a walk and connect somehow with either performance or art. Uh, in either suburban, rural space, site or route specific. And the wonder score should consider the visual or poetic relationship between the page and the place 
in which the wonder was first experienced, or in which the wonder was imagined. The wonder scores are playful manifestos, experience, uh, experiential encounters that give room for interpretation. Tate Modern came across our little book, and they invited us to design a five-week summer school in the gallery in 2017. Walking through the gallery stimulates the imagination, of course, so we don't really need to think about alternative ways to, to wander this space, do we? But Rebecca Solnit says, standing or wandering slowly makes my feet hurt. It's why museums and malls are more painful than the mountains. So we were thinking, how could we reimagine the way we spend time in art galleries? What would be an alternative approach to this ingrained walk, stop and glance? Is there one specific route we tend to follow? And is that because we are unconsciously following other people's routes? Is the walk relational to space or the artwork? How might we wander in proximity to sculpture? Do we feel heavy? Might a watercolour soften our gait? Might a collage quicken our pace? When we see a photograph of Joseph Boys walking, do we take on his qualities as we move into other rooms? In the turbine hall, we walked for up to a couple of hours until our gait turned to movement on the floor. We got into a state of meditative play, accompanied by the sound of Bruce Nauman's raw material being pumped out on repeat. In other rooms, walking with the artwork as an embodied intervention prompted multiple tracing experiences. Participants walked in situ with the painting. They traced the architectural lines of Julie Mariccio's Columbus painting, Magoma Part Three, by mimicking the layers of her work as if it was a score for movement. We found this was a completely new way of walking and viewing art. It was an embodied experience. So we published another book of scores called Ways to Wander the Gallery. These have become really popular, I'm quite overwhelmed by it. Claire and I are absolutely delighted. These people are walking them globally. Um, a conference in Montreal based all of their themes on Ways to Wander. Blake Morris, the artist, walked them globally and with other people. And the Kansas City Arts Institute invited us in March 2020 to develop this huge project based on the book. So Claire and I were packed, ready to go to Kansas City to lead a Ways to Wander project. But it was March 2020 and everything changed. Um, this is my daughter, Amelie. Um, she's in the audience tonight. Hello, Amelie. Love you to bits. I um, take her hiking quite regularly. We have done since she was a child. Also, take my, my, my go with my niece sometimes. My niece is in the audience. We are a walking family. Hello, Lucy. Um, we just love hiking our family. And this is the impossible space. This is the devil's kitchen, the black hole. Now, for hikers like me, it's, it's relatively easy to get to. And if you're a scrambler, it's not that hard. And they've built a path there now. So it is actually quite accessible at the bottom. You've just got to do a bit of a scramble at the top. But during the period of restricted movement, we weren't sort of allowed into Wales. It was always seemingly the case that Every time we tried to go and see family, restrictions had been lifted in England, but they'd been locked in Wales. It was really frustrating. So Amelie and I did regular walks when we were permitted to walk further afield to um, the North Yorkshire coast. And I started to fall in love with uh, the rocks there and the geology there of the bay at Ravenscar. It's an extraordinary place for geology if you're really interested in geology. I'm not a geologist, but I'm really interested in connecting to these worlds. And um, so, yeah, so um, Claire and I couldn't work together. Um, lots of us couldn't work together physically, of course. None of us could. So we worked remotely by going to the places that we wanted to walk and starting to develop some sort of project somehow. And we were uh, in inspired by an artist called Valley Export who created this performance called Body Configurations in the 1960s. It was just a starter point for us to try and connect with the local environment while the world was quiet. The world was very quiet. So Amelie and I would regularly hike there, and I would perform, and Claire would perform in London, I would perform here, and Amelie um, took these photographs that we're just about to see. I am a performer walking. 
the sentient shapeshifter, gathering energy from geological matter. Rather than collect pebbles, I hold my body close, mold into their shape and mimic their direction, understand textures through intimate contact. I scatter across this bay from rock to scar, claiming a space that connects me and my finds to the universe uh, that splits visible time and space. We made a little sign, performance in progress. It rests above on the cliff where 22 metres of coastline has eroded. A series of actions engaged in fleetingly. My imagination is shaped by the temporal environment. I let the water wash over me, channeling a different kind of time and the rock's vibrations. I heard very recently that mountains are moving all of the time. They sway and move gently from the seismic rhythms of the earth. The Matterhorn vibrates every two seconds from the world's ambient energy. This hum has been described as the song of the mountain. It's low frequency, we can't hear it, but it is there. 